So I am defining it as an intentional break from traditional school and employment. Some people might call it a sabbatical, but essentially what we're doing is we are taking the kids out of public school, we are leaving our W-2 jobs, and we are going to do really whatever it is we want to do. For our Family Fi segment, we're talking about achieving financial independence with kids. Now, a lot of people think that you have to choose one or the other. You can't have financial independence if you've got kids, or you can't have kids if you want financial independence. Well, our guest today is going to share her path to financial independence with kids. Heidi Dusick is my guest today. Heidi is a foundation executive, a mom of three, and a wife to a DIY kind of guy. She continues to live an intentional life, challenging herself not to get too comfortable or align with the status quo. Recently, Heidi and her family are working on a family gap year. We're going to discuss what that is and how her family is going to make that happen. Welcome to the show, Heidi. Thank you so much for having me, Andy. It's exciting to be here. I'm excited to have you and to talk about this uh, adventure you've been on as a family. It sounds like you're all about adventure. Let's talk about when you decided you wanted financial independence for your family. Yeah, it's funny because I was a, I probably wouldn't have said I was financially independent for a while, but I knew the concepts. I had come back from um, a high cost of living area. I was living in Chicago, came back to Wisconsin in 2008 and was required to teach financial independence, or not really financial independence, personal finance. And I remember reading the book, The Millionaire Next Door. And that kind of got me thinking like, oh, this lifestyle makes sense to me. Like I fit within this. And those principles have always stayed, but I probably didn't really jump into the FI world until about 2017. And that's when I really got clear about, I knew I'd been saving, but I didn't know what I was saving for. I knew I was supposed to do it. I knew compound interest was a thing, but you know, you add a couple of kids, your lifestyle inflates a little bit. And so it gave me this good direction and clarity around what was I working for? Yeah. And then at that moment, what were some of those epiphany moments where you said, I think that I want to save or invest for X? What, what was it for you? Yeah. Well, there were a couple of things that happened. So in Wisconsin, I don't want to get political or anything, but in Wisconsin, my husband and I were both public employees and Act 10 happened and we saw a drastic decrease in our income. And that made us think differently about okay, if we're actually working towards something, we need to get really intentional that we can't both be on the same system. Like one of us has got to go private or one of us has to be working for salary and one has to work for benefits. And that actually was pretty fun because then we got intentional about like, well, what else do we want to work for? You know, maybe we think about what we want in our vacation or what do we want in our savings tools? So then we started kind of shopping for employers, which, you know, we found an HSA option. We found a sabbatical option, you know, all these things that we were like, these are so many tools of FI. Let's go after that. And that really sent us on the, the matrix towards a family gap year, which I know we'll talk more and more about. I love that. Yeah, we'll jump into the family gap year. Talk to us about what you guys did or are doing for your careers? I know we've alluded to it a little bit. Could you be more specific? Yeah. So my husband was a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, he has since left um, as of last school year. And I, at that time, I was in the UW system. So I was like a researcher, program development and evaluation was my title. And when I switched over, I worked in family philanthropy now. So I work for a private family foundation, helping them give their money away essentially Got working it. in community what is, development. What does UW mean? I'm sorry. What is, what does UW oh, mean? University of Wisconsin system. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm the sorry. college system. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, is that an acronym for an industry that I'm not aware of? No, it's okay. I got it. No. I got it. I mean, we're, we're talking locally. That makes a lot of sense. So, so talk to us about the, the process. You started to move towards this. You started to look at different employers. Talk to us about how that process went. Now you said your husband is not working anymore. Was that a, a, a conscious choice? Have you guys done that to more pursue towards your family fi adventures? Talk to us about that. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me start with me. <laughs> yep. I, Knowing that I was going to be the one that was going to go after the higher salary, I actually had to do some mindset work that I was worth a higher salary. I had always okay. worked like in that $40,000 range. And I was like, okay, I have to go after higher dollars. Like this is not something. So getting really comfortable in putting myself around people who were ahead of me on this journey, who not necessarily just made more money, but like could be mentors. I think that was a key in all of this is finding the masters and being an apprentice. Then I think it was really about um, deciding, you know, what else could we start negotiating for? So it's so uncomfortable to talk about money and to put negotiations on the table. And I had heard this advice and I took it to never take the first salary, like never pay the first bill, never take the first salary. And so that was really helpful too, because now 
I started to get empowered by what I was seeing. And I think the third thing that really helped me just get over that mindset piece was there are comp and benefit studies on every sector and every job. And a compensation and benefit study can be a really helpful tool in understanding, like, where do I start? What what are the numbers for this market? That, I think, gave me a lot of power, too, to say, oh, I actually was being really undervalued and I didn't even know it. I just had accepted that that was the salary. I think that's great. So so you went from $40,000 and you, based on utilizing that methodology, have you grown your salary substantially since then? Yeah. So the next job I took was 75 and then I went over six figures after that. So it, it grew really fast. Within a couple of years, I was I had almost doubled, well, for sure doubled, almost tripled my salary by the time within five years of that initial process. That's incredible. Yeah. And, and you'd attribute that, as you were saying, to just realizing you don't have to be stuck here. I, there are tools to help me grow double, triple what I'm doing. Yeah. And once we did that, I think what helped us is we didn't leave the lifestyle that we had behind. So we still tried living on a, you know, our budget at that time, I think we were making like 70 or 80,000, right? So we, we had still been saving and we tried to keep that 70 to $80,000 lifestyle. So we automated as much as we could to not even see it. So we tried to really use all the tools that my husband had and doubled down because he could use a 457 and a 401 or 403B, I guess, in the public sector and an HSA. So as much as we could, we would max those out. And as much as I could, I would max them out. And then essentially I was paying for all of our living expenses on my salary because I didn't have quite as many tools. But then even after tax, you know, automate what goes into brokerage, automate what goes into our Roth. And when you do that for five years, you'd be amazed what happens. It's not just doubling your salary, but you're also just like quantifying your lifestyle in multiples. Absolutely. And, and, and not only are you investing for the future like you did, but you're also deciding how much is enough. And it sounds like that seventy dollars to $80,000 range you're living in Wisconsin is pretty good for you and your family as far as enjoying life and still investing for the future. So that intentionality probably helped you quite a bit. So talk to us about when your husband moved from uh, working to not working. Yeah, that was interesting. So he stopped working because we're taking this gap year. So he still likes his job and we're both still good at our jobs. And I think that was one of our decisions is we kind of wanted to go out on top because we plan on coming back and going to work. It's not like we're retiring we think at the, right now, I mean, everything's up in the air, but we think we want to go back to work when we come back. And so we're trying to keep really good relationships. So he's done things like substitute teaching. He He's never not worked or never really knew he had an option to consider what he really liked to do. So we're calling this his like unschooling period of just deciding like, what could you do? And he's done everything. Like I mentioned, he's a DIY kind of guy. So he's done some work on the house. He's done some substitute teaching. He's working actually with a local construction company right now doing some finishing work. And then we're going to be traveling in an RV. So he's like, you know, what if I got my RV technician license and I could help other people on the road and be a technician? And these are all things he genuinely enjoys. And if it happens that he can make income along the way, then that's just like a double bonus. I love it. I love it. So, okay. So talk to us about what is a family gap year. I'm very interested. Define that for us and then tell yeah. us how you're doing it. Yeah. So I am defining it as an intentional break from traditional school and employment. Some people might call it a sabbatical, but essentially what we're doing is we are taking the kids out of public school. We are leaving our W-2 jobs and we are going to do really whatever it is we want to do. <laughs> but most of that will involve travel. And we have tested this now for different parts and pieces of this, right? Do we want to travel in an airplane and go, you know, we were in Hawaii for a month. Like, what? how did that feel? Did we like staying in Airbnbs? Did we like, you know, using other people's stuff? Did we like having a different place to stay every night? And it was kind of funny because in that case, the kids missed the dog. And they're like, the dog's got to come, mom. We're not leaving without the dog. And so I was like, well, how are we going to do this? And that's kind of how we landed in an RV. And we rented an RV. We tried it. And we're like, okay, we're still traveling way too fast. We've got to slow down. So I think we've just continued to experiment with things and say, did that fit? Did that fit? Does this work? What do you think about this? <laughs> and that... The last time we left the summer, we stayed in driveways with friends. And that was like, oh my gosh, this is so much fun. We're like, we don't feel like we're isolated or that we're stuck as a family. We are actually interacting and building relationships with people we don't get to see very often. So it was so much fun. And yet we still had a place to go home to every night. I love that. Okay. talk to the, we, we talk about money a lot of the show. Talk yeah. to us about the financials. How can you afford to take a year off of your job, his job? Uh, how do you pay for that? 
Yeah. So again, we, we knew we wanted to come back to work. So we aren't retiring. We're not completely fi. We are coast fi with a little extra. So we're probably, we're probably almost half fi. Um, so coast fi is how we addressed all of our long-term retirement type things, all of our long-term savings, all of our 401k, 403bs, that had to be at our coast fi number. And then we have kind of this middle ground of a Roth 401k, 403b, and we have our Roth IRA and we have an HSA. You know, those are kind of like loose where we could draw from them if we had to. So we're calling that kind of our our midterm savings slash emergency savings now, because if we had to, we would have three to six months at least. We have more than that, but at least three to six months buffer in that zone, <laughs> that little sliver. And then our short term savings had once been referred to as our emergency savings. That's our taxable brokerage account. It's our savings account. It is, my husband also has a 457. And that was another tool that we could use that we can draw on for living expenses while we're traveling. And so we needed at least a year's worth of expenses there. So, and we're, we're really still leaving doors open for a little bit of work. My husband both and I both realized we like a little bit of structure. You know, we aren't going to be traveling so fast and we're going to be schooling. Like we're not going to be like in vacation mode all the time. We're going to be lifing. <laughs> like we need a lifestyle that just fits in a little bit more with adventure and, and travel. So we are still keeping doors open for freelance and for consulting and contract work and stuff like that. So we are still basing a, sa a small amount for income to be earned next year. Got it. Okay. So between investments and savings and a little part-time money, you guys are going to be well set for, for the year. Talk to me as a parent for the schooling thing. So I don't know if you guys have been doing homeschooling before this uh, or if you're doing school. So how, how, how does that work? How do you take kids out of school for a year? Yeah. Well, it was kind of funny because we were thinking about this and then COVID hit and COVID is not at all what we wanted, right? <laughs> and nor was that the experience that we were designing, but it gave us a sense of what we don't want. So we don't want to do online school. My husband and I are both certified teachers. So I will say we do have context behind what the educational system is looking for, what benchmarks, what, you know, where, where they need to be when they come back, so to speak. Um, but we had this other interesting thing happen last year. My daughter had an accident and ended up breaking both arms and was out of school for three months. Now, that is not desirable. But what happened was we learned that when she self-designed her, the format we're looking at is like project-based self-directed self learning is the model that we're looking at. So we, we tested it with her and she went back, like she was 10 times ahead of where she was and she was ahead of all of her classmates. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> this is insane. So we are using project-based learning, self-directed learning as kind of the model. And my oldest son has a project already in mind. He's starting a business. He loves tying flies and fly fishing. And so that's going to be like one of his major homeschool projects. And we know that there's going to be his website's got to get developed. So there's writing, there's research that he's doing. So we're still going to hit all of those things. And we're designing our our itinerary or our route to be educational and based, you know, we're going to do a civil rights tours and plantation visits, and we're going to be in DC visiting a lot of the constitution and understanding what that all means. So there's a lot of education built into the design of our trip as well. I love that. Okay. We're checking the boxes here. We talked about money. We talked about the kids for school. If you got, do you guys own your home in Wisconsin? And if so, what are you guys going to do with that? Yes, we do own our home. And that was the thing, you know, when we were looking for models or looking for masters, so to speak in this space, there's a lot of young couples. There's a lot of retired couples. There's not a lot of families. So I think finding families that do this was one thing. And another thing was we found a lot of families, but they sold it all. And they were like living mm -hmm. off of that. We actually own a family property. It's it's like a fourth generation farmhouse that we own. So we weren't willing to sell it. So we have um, kind of made a deal that we're going to come home every three to four months and we're going to keep deciding what are we going to do with the house for the next stint. Because it's like all the holidays, I'm winding down work, the kids are still in school. Like there's a lot going on in December. We decided we're not ready when we leave in January. We're not ready to rent it out. We might consider that going forward. Nothing has been like formally decided. It's just a lot of work to get your house ready for, you know, it's like selling it. You might as well sell it at that point, but there's just a lot of staging and cleaning and packing your stuff up and getting it in secure spaces. So 
we weren't quite ready for that, but we'll see. We'll see how it works. And if money's not coming in and we're feeling nervous about it, well, we can stop. We can come home. We can rent the house. We still have a couple of other options. Oh man, I think that I think that's great. So it's you guys have prepared and you've got a situation for your kids and the house is already taken care of. So I guess my, my question is, if you look back one year from now, how will you deem success, Heidi? How will you mm. say that was great? What, 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 what will you count as success? I love this question. So I started this work like five years ago because I heard so many people hit FI and then they were kind of like lost their identity. And so we experimented. I'm just going to like warn you. I'm a little bit of a geek. I was a researcher. Okay. So <laughs> we did a joy audit about four or five years ago Ooh. and we started to say like, okay, on a scale of one to five, like, was that a five? And what it was it? What was it about that experience? And so we do a lot of check-ins with our kids. And part of the reason why we're going now is our kids are telling us, we got to go now, mom, because I'm not going to do this in high school. I want to be back for sports or I want to be back for this. And we didn't leave until my daughter had her first concert. You know, so there's a lot of checkpoints and it's not just your identity around money and work. It's, you know, what spiritually, how do we feel and how's our friends and social life going and how are we feeling as a family? Are we fighting a lot more? Are we feeling like we're our relationships are getting challenged in ways that we didn't want? Or how are my husband and I doing in all of this? You know, I think those are constant checkpoints for us. And using this little joy rating that I that I kind of optimize for, um, it's been a good experiment. I think that's great. Yeah, and checking in with your family. It sounds like you guys are open to lots of communication between you and your husband, between you and your kids, and just kind of checking on what kind of family life do we want to have? What kind of adventures do we want to go on? And, and go from there. So it, sound, it sounds like, Heidi, you are all about adventure. Tell us more about your platform, your podcast, where people can connect with you and learn more from you. Yes. Thank you. I am all about adventure. I, and I think it can be small and large, right? So this is a big adventure, but adventures can be in your own backyard. And the power of that has been really monumental, I think, for our family to help us connect, to have a good time. So my platform is Ordinary Sherpa. You can find me on any podcast player. And the intent is really to help families connect through simple and authentic adventures. So designing what your life is like or just doing something for the weekend that really helps your family connect, be together and learn from something just a little uncomfortable. I think that's the goal is getting a little outside your comfort zone. You can find me pretty much on any platform, though, in terms of, you know, social media. Pro probably if you want to follow along on this whole adventure, Instagram is probably where I'll be posting more personally on where we are and what we did and what we learned, the good, the bad, and the in-between. This is where this intersection of financial independence and family come together. So Heidi's a perfect guest for today. Heidi, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me.